Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. All dental hygiene instruments have three basic parts, the handle, the shank, and the working end. Graphically, you can see the handle, the largest and widest portion of the instrument, the shank, which connects the handle to the terminal section of the instrument, or the working end. Instrument handles may vary in size and have slight modification in shape and surface texture. The diameter of the handle should be wide enough to allow a comfortable grasp without cramping the fingers or muscles of the hand. A handle that is too thin will cramp the muscles in the hand and inhibit pre precise control of the instrument. In addition, a handle that is too thin will become slippery and more difficult to manipulate during the scaling procedure. You may run across a variety of handle shapes and sizes. They may be ribbed or waffle ironed with indentations in the center. They may have ribbing going only one half of the length of the handle. The ribbing may extend almost the entire length of the handle with a slight smooth portion in between. Or there may be a very rough texture for the first third of the handle and a smooth texture for the remaining portion of the handle. The shank of the instrument is thinner than the handle and is that part which connects the handle to the terminal segment or working end of the instrument. It is important to consider both the length and angulation of the shank when choosing an instrument. The shank may be straight as the one you see here. or may be modified with several curves to allow adaptation to the more posterior portions of the mouth. A straight shank would be used on an anterior tooth where we have a very minimal amount of pocket depth in a normal clinical crown. If you were scaling in an area that had a longer clinical crown and recession, you would need a longer shank. The curved shanks help us to adapt the instrument to the more posterior areas of the mouth. The working end of the instrument is the terminal segment. The shape of the working end determines the classification and use of the instrument. The instrument may have a single working end or a double working end. I'd like just to turn this instrument around so that you can see that the opposite end also has a working end. It is a mirror shaped image of the um, other end of the instrument. A single ended, single ended instrument has only one working end and you can see that. The working end of the instrument may also be removable. This is referred to as a cone socket instrument. Cone socket instruments are less expensive to replace, but they have a disadvantage in that they frequently become loosened during the scaling procedure. Therefore, the only cone socket instrument that we use in our dental hygiene procedures is the mouth mirror. The handle, the shank, and the working end of the instrument play an important part in the balance of the instrument. For an instrument to be perfectly balanced, the center of the working end, as you can see in both the left and middle 
views on the screen must be centered over the long axis of the handle. If the instrument is not balanced, it is difficult to use and we will frequently have problems with tissue trauma and laceration. In addition, the length between the working end of the instrument and the portion of the shank nearest the handle should not be more than one and one quarter inches to allow for proper balance. There are two grasps used in dental hygiene procedures, the modified pen grasp and the palm grasp. The most efficient and stable grasp for all dental hygiene instruments is the modified pen grasp. Although the palm grasp is possible, the slight variation of the conventional or standard pen grasp ensures the greatest control in performing intraoral procedures. Using your right hand, pick up your pencil with the thumb, middle finger, and index finger as you would for writing. This is the standard pen grasp. Now switch to your instrument and move your middle finger until the pad of the middle finger rather than the side is on the shank of the instrument. Move the handle of the instrument until it rests between the second and third joints on your hand. Adjust your index finger so that it is opposite the thumb. This is the modified pen grasp. If you were to turn your hand around, you would see that the index finger and middle finger are touching each other slightly, although the index finger is slightly more flexed than your middle finger. If you allow the handle of the instrument to rest in the V of your hand, that is the, the V formed between the index finger and your thumb, you will lose control of the instrument. The instrument is very easily knocked from your hand. If you allow the instrument to rest anterior to the third joint, or to the second joint of the index finger, you again lose control of your instrument. The most stable position is with the handle of the instrument resting between the second and third joints of the index finger. The thumb and forefinger are across from one another, and the middle finger is on the shank of the instrument. The pad rests on the shank of the instrument. This is the modified pen grasp. It is not enough to be able to control your instrument in a stable position. You must be able to control it using this grasp while you move it. To do this, practice rolling your instrument between your fingers in a clockwise direction approximately 180 degrees, keeping the instrument on the pad of the middle finger. When you have rolled 180 degrees, roll counterclockwise, approximately the same distance. Practice rolling your instrument between your fingers until you are able to do this. This grasp is the correct grasp for all dental hygiene instruments. It is used both with the instrument in the right hand and the mirror in the left, or the instrument in the left hand and mirror in the right for left-handed clinicians. The second grasp that I mentioned is the palm grasp. This grasp is used only with the air and water syringe. It inhibits tactile sense and is slightly dangerous when used with scaling instruments in the patient's mouth. The instrument is merely held in the palm with the thumb at the top, used only for the air and water syringe. The fulcrum serves as a pivot point for the movement of dental hygiene instruments. It helps to stabilize the instrument and provide control and thereby provides protection for the patient. The finger rest or fulcrum 
serves to stabilize the hand and the instrument by providing a firm point of rest as movements are made to activate the instrument. A good finger rest provides protection from laceration by poorly controlled instruments and ensures efficient removal of calculus because the fulcrum acts as a finger rest when, or pivot point when force is applied to dislodge a deposit. To understand how the finger rest acts as a fulcrum, imagine that the instrument is a lever, the blue arrow pointing to the black line or the lever. By resting the pad of your ring finger on a stable surface, such as the teeth, indicated by the white triangle and the red arrow, your hand can pivot upon this point and move the instrument in a variety of directions. When the instrument blade encounters resistance, force is applied to the instrument by rotating the wrist and forearm and pivoting upon the fulcrum finger. The force enables the instrument to remove the deposit from the tooth surface and lift it out of the sulcus. Uh, intraorally, the ring finger is the fulcrum. It is placed stably on a tooth surface, preferably the occlusal surface of the tooth next to the tooth you're working on. Therefore, if I were going to be scaling on tooth number 30, my fulcrum finger would be placed on the occlusal surface of the adjacent premolars. The middle finger is placed against the fulcrum finger to provide more stability and control for our grasp. We can then move in a variety of directions, maintaining our fulcrum. As we moved posteriorly, our fulcrum finger moves with us. And as we move anteriorly, the fulcrum will also move with us. It is important to provide a broad base for your fulcrum. We fulcrum on occlusal surfaces, on lingual surfaces, on the opposite side of the mouth, which I will not demonstrate, we would fulcrum on the buccal surface. We can fulcrum on several incisal edges in the anterior region of the mouth, always keeping our ring finger and our middle finger in contact with one another to provide stability. A fulcrum is used for all oral hygiene procedures. We use it for scaling, holding our scalers. It is used with a mirror whenever possible. We use it when cleansing and polishing. There are two types of fulcrum, the intraoral fulcrum, which you see here, and an extraoral fulcrum. The extraoral fulcrum being the placement of the fulcrum finger on soft tissue. The fulcrum should ideally be placed on hard tissue to provide additional stability. When placed on soft tissue, the tissue tends to move and we lose stability with our fulcrum finger. All fulcrums are placed as close as possible to the area we are working in. When we place the fulcrum at a distance, we lose a certain amount of our stability and mobility. The fulcrum is always placed in the arch and the quadrant that we are working on. We do not fulcrum in the mandible to work on a maxillary area, or do we fulcrum in the maxilla to work on the mandible. Let me remind you that the fulcrum finger is the ring finger, it is placed on a broad surface the middle finger placed against a shank of our instrument is placed on the fulcrum finger for stability. We fulcrum intraorally in the arch and quadrant we are working on and as near as possible to the tooth that we are working on. Wrist motion is used to activate the instrument. The wrist motion involves the combined use of the wrist the hand and the forearm as a single unit. There are two types of wrist motion, a wrist rock and a pivot. 
The wrist rock is a slow, methodical movement of the wrist from left to right. After placing your fulcrum finger and properly placing your instrument, rock on the fulcrum finger, moving the instrument and the wrist slowly from left to right. I'd like you to notice that the back of my hand, my wrist, and my forearm are in almost a perfectly straight line. And my elbow does not move. Only my wrist is moving, rocking on the fulcrum finger to activate the instrument. The pivot is an up and down motion of the wrist. Again, placing the fulcrum finger and the instrument, lowering and raising the wrist. Very slow, very controlled movement. Again, as I come up, you can see that the back of the hand and the wrist and the forearm are in a straight line. And then as I pivot down, there's a slight bend at the wrist. My elbow is not moving as an independent unit, but is moving only as the wrist is lowered in conjunction with the forearm. I'd also like you to notice my hand as I'm pivoting here. Notice that you see no independent finger movement, only the movement of the wrist. The wrist is used to activate all instruments, either in a pivot or in a rock, and no independent finger movement is used. There are some fairly basic rules for the use of the pivot and rock. The pivot is used more on the interproximal surfaces of your molars and premolars, and the rock is used more on anterior teeth and buccal and lingual surfaces, although these rules are not stringent and we can substitute pivot or rock wherever um, the stroke works best. Again keeping the back of the hand, the wrist, and the forearm in a straight line. The elbow is not moving independently and rocking, pivoting the wrist up and down or rocking left to right. This is your wrist motion which is used for activating all dental hygiene instruments. Two strokes are used during instrumentation procedures. The exploratory stroke and the working stroke. The exploratory stroke is used to detect deposits, tooth irregularities, and restorations. The stroke is generally toward the tissue with a very light grasp and careful control. The working stroke is used to remove the deposits. The stroke is away from the epithelial attachment toward the occlusal or incisal surface, um, used with a much firmer grasp and involves short overlapping strokes. Both strokes are used in all instrumentation procedures and will be discussed more thoroughly with a specific instrument. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.